So uh, we move on to our third presenter, uh, will be uh, Jose Calvotel. Uh, Jose works as a researcher and subject librarian at the Gottingen State and University Library, where he is responsible for digital humanities, romance studies, and history of art. His research is focused on the application and development of computational methods, such as machine learning and natural language processing, applied to romance literatures and library records, which is precisely the talk uh, he will uh, do today. Uh, Jose, uh, please start when you are ready. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will be presenting uh, alone, but actually Enrique is also here uh, to answer questions later. So the topic of this presentation uh, is uh, machine learning for subject indexing. And this is a topic that has been around um, for quite some time. Uh, but I think in the past years, uh, we have seen a new generation of algorithms and tools uh, that has been um, uh, presented. Um, and one of the um, main tools is ANIF, uh, which we just heard about. Uh, developed at the National Library of Finland and then applied to other institutions such as for example the German National Library as we just heard or the Information Center for Economics. Um, national libraries are a very special kind of library uh, and they have in some cases a very um, specific perspective and um, the majority of the national libraries, they have the, the records of, the, of these libraries are in one language or perhaps two or three languages. And in general, this is not representative for many other kinds of, of libraries, for example, university libraries. Uh, in the catalog of the library network, uh, where that my library uh, belongs to, um, we have records of more than 400 languages. And we consider that there is a certain risk of reinforcing already privileged languages, uh, such as English and German, when we apply machine learning. Uh, so for, the, for this reason, we think that uh, it should be a priority for the libraries to work with multilingual models. And when we talk about multilingual models, we mean models that are able, so a single model should be able to analyze um, input in different languages. So for this specific presentation and this study, uh, we have taken the, um, the case of the Roman studies. Uh, Roman studies is, a f is the field that um, studies languages derived from Latin, their culture and literatures. And in this field, we find um, records, we find publications in different languages and we can organize these languages in four groups. First, we find some uh, resources rich Romance languages such as Spanish, French, or Italian. Then we find uh, some languages with notably fewer resources, such as Romanian or Galician. We find also a bunch of middle cases, such as Portuguese or Catalan. And then we also find non-Romance languages, such as German or English, which are resources rich and which are used as communication language in this field. So in this field, there is no national perspective. There is no national library for Roman studies. And this field in itself is multilingual. So it is a challenge for current machine learning and natural language processing uh, approaches. However, the, all these languages, they do share some uh, similarities. For example, they share Latin script. As a the classification system, we use basis classification or in English basic classification. This is a middle-sized monohierarchic library classification system, and actually it's actually one of the most frequently assigned classification systems in the German speaking area. The labels are currently only expressed in German. Uh, this classification system is published openly and it contains 48 uh, main classes and a little bit more than 2,000 um, subclasses in total. Uh, so here are some, some real examples. Uh, translate labels are, in this case, translated into English. Uh, so the class 17.97 would be text by a single author, would have 18.38 for Portuguese literature outside Portugal. And then we have here some examples to 
for um, art, physics, or computer science. Um, so we use specific classification to identify the uh, publications, the records about Roman studies in our catalog. Uh, we've, we use this regular expression that you see here, 18.203. And because we are analyzing um, publications from philology, we only consider the classes, the subclasses uh, hanging from the 17 and 18 classes, which are the, same, the main classes uh, for the philologies. The basic classification has a total depth of five levels. Um, however, for this study, we have, we have remodeled this into only three levels. The first level um, is the main classes. In our case, only these two, uh, the 17 and the 18. The second level is has the, uh, all the direct tiles of these main classes, um, in total 63 in our case. And then we consider also the full level. So the entire tree is rooted at these two classes. In this case, 157 possible classes. About the data set that we analyze, uh, we are taking our records from this database called K uh, K10 Plus, uh, which is a, a shared database uh, for two German library networks. We have filtered them from this, uh, so we have filtered publications published after 1980 to 2019. And uh, after this filtering, we come to a data set close to uh, 200,000 records. Um, so the total number of labels that we are analyzing is around uh, 160, 157, uh, to be more specific. Um, interestingly, from the computer science perspective, this could be already a case of extreme multi-label learning. The task is multi-label because every record can be associated with, one, with more than one uh, class. And actually, if we look at the labels per record, uh, we see a mean number of 1.8 labels per record and a standard deviation of 0 0.7. So per record, we would normally we would find between one and three labels of these classes. We are analyzing in this case only data from the catalog, so only metadata. So we do not have the full text of these publications. And we operationalize three different use cases through different fields from the catalog. Um, first, we consider only having the title, then having the basic bibliographic data, and then extended metadata. What do we mean with these three use cases? The first of all, title would mean that we really only have the title of the publication, and that's it. We wouldn't have uh, any more data. Bibliographic data is the most general case. For example, when we obtain data from the publishers or from bibliographies printed or digital, such as in Sotero. And in this case, we would have information about the title, but also the information about uh, the publisher and the place of publication. And then we would have the extended uh, data use case. This is specific for libraries. For example, when we have a lot of metadata in our catalog, but we wouldn't have the uh, labels of the basic classification. So we would have, in this case, the bibliographic data plus further fields, such as summary, information about work, expression, labels from other classification systems, key and keywords. And of course, uh, our hypothesis is that um, the results will be better whenever we have uh, more data, more fields. About methods and experiments, um, we apply two different classification algorithms. And first, we use multilingual BERT, uh, which was uh, proposed uh, three years ago. And we have fine-tuned it uh, using a sigmoid loss function of the multiple classes. And for comparison, we also use a support vector machine um, classifier, which we will call linear model in the figures a multi-label classifier using a linear kernel. Uh, for the input, we use the vectorized representation of the raw metadata of the catalog. And for this vectoriz uh, vectorization, um, we use the tokenizer of MBERT. 
So in this table, you see some real examples of the titles on the left, on the original titles, as we find it in the catalog, and then the tokenization by bird. So you would, uh, you would see that um, some tokens uh, by bird are actual uh, words in the original uh, titles, and some others are just parts of words. We split the data set into training, development, and test sets. Um, and these have the original distribution of labels. Uh, we compute F1 micro and macro, and we need to consider, we need to, to have in mind that there is a considerable skewness about the distribution of the labels. We also compute a random baseline uh, following the distribution of labels just to see how hard uh, the task is actually. And the code is, on, is online available and we are still working on it. About the results, uh, about the results and discussion, um, here you see uh, the different results. Uh, so first of all, the green line represents the random baseline, um, and then the blue line is the results by Embert, and the orange line is uh, the results by the support vector machine, so the linear model. So. In the horizontal line, you find the different tasks. So first, we would try to find just the first level of the labels. So this task, because we are only considering two main classes, this task is too easy. So this is why the baseline is so high. But already at, this, at the um, second level, and especially at the full level, uh, the baseline drops very close to zero. And in these cases, uh, we would find uh, at the second level, level and we would find would, yeah we, we have uh, f1 macro of around 0 0.5 and 0 0.4 and at the full level we would find uh, that the results are around 0 0.4 um, in general we observe that um, um, embert obtains better results than the linear model uh, with a gain of around 0 0.05 and relating to the feature sets, um, as expected, uh, when we pass more data, uh, the results uh, get also better. So the extended uh, features um, um, obtain the better, the higher, the highest results. However, actually, the difference between the extended data and bibliographic data is, 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 is smaller than we expected. So we find actually. Um, relatively uh, similar results, uh, only just giving to the algorithm these three uh, fields of bibliographic data. Now we have some research questions about the results, and the first one, the first groups of, of questions is, is related to uh, the languages. So do the algorithms achieve higher risk scores for some languages, especially considering the number of publications? So that's kind of, do we find that the more publications leads to better classification results? Or uh, does it happen that more publication leads to more heterogeneity of the data and therefore to worse classification results, which is actually, in, in some cases, it happens in classification tasks. So here are the results for the different languages. So on the horizontal line, you find uh, the different languages and we do observe uh, that, for example, if we look here at the second level, uh, we would find that the results are the results are higher for French, Spanish, Italian, uh, German, and English. So it does appear that there is a correlation between the number of publication and results. And to look closer into that, uh, we plot this as a scatter plot. So here, the data points are languages. And the horizontal line represents the number of publications, and the vertical axis uh, represents the, uh, the scores of the classification. And, and in the different experiments, um, we obtain from strong to very strong correlations, and these are statistically significant. Um, these correlations are slightly stronger for a uh, multilingual bird than for the linear model. So, in other, in other words, uh, we do find that more data leads to better classification results, or in other words, the algorithms are reinforcing already privileged languages. 
And the second group of questions that we have is relating to the classes. And these are similar. So do the algorithms achieve higher scores uh, for some classes? Um, and this is actually uh, supported by our experience um, of a subject librarian, Susanne Alariani and I work as subject librarians also, and we know that some classes are harder to, to assign than others. So these are the results for all the classes in the different uh, settings and the different algorithms. I know this is a lot of information, but what we observe is that the line goes um, all over the place, right? So we obtain very high results for some classes and for other classes, are, um, um, the results are very low. So we have a very high dispersion of, of the results. And this is what, you know, this is not ideal uh, because that means some classes are very opaque to the algorithm while others are very clear to the algorithm. In general, we observe for all the classes that the, the, the tendencies are very similar. In other words, um, multilingual Beric obtains better results. Extended data also obtains better results. However, we observe some exceptions. For example, in some classes, the linear model actually uh, performs uh, much better than multilingual BERT. And this happened actually in a, in a group of, of cases. While in other cases, uh, it it happens kind of the opposite. So for example, here is there's this group of classes, 17.7, um, about literature, different classes from, from literary studies. And in these classes, the gain of multilingual BERT is much higher than for the rest of the classes. So apparently, MBERT is able to understand better classes about literature, literature than the linear model, which was kind of a surprise. And another thing that we observe is that whenever the linear model, um, not always, but there is this tendency that when the linear model obtains the better results, it does it with only bibliographic data. So in other words, it appears that multilingual BERT is uh, more suited when more information is, is available, more fields. And next, we have this question whether the number of, of, of classes uh, by the whether the number of publications um, of by classes and uh, leads to better scores. And here, actually, the, the, the answer is not so simple as for the languages, uh, because what we find here is that uh, for the classes with a relatively um, low number of publication, we have a very high dispersion again. So um, some of these classes have low number of publication, but in some cases, they obtain very high results, and in some cases, they are systematically mislabeled. However, when we uh, when the classes obtain more uh, records, uh, then the tendency is that the results will, will improve. So again, we observe here statistical correlations. And so in other words, it means that uh, the number of publications influences the results of the algorithms. So already in the conclusions and outreach, um, in these presentations, we are only analyzing uh, records publications in the field of Roman languages. And um, in this case, we obtain a macro F1 scores around 0 0.4, which is not great, but actually, actually we would find it uh, decent, especially uh, when we consider that uh, the random baseline is very close to zero. In general, we observe better results for multilingual BERT, and we do observe that the more publications, the better the results, and the more fields we pass to the algorithm, the better. However, the results are already reasonable uh, with only basic bibliographic data. And we think that basis classification is, probably, is possibly better suited for machine learning tasks than all the classification systems. Um, we wanted to stress again that um, the majority of the catalogs contain publications in many languages. This is why we think that working on multilingual models should be a priority. And what we observe is that some languages obtain notably worse results than others, and some classes are systematically mislabeled. So in other words, um, a full automatic subject indexing could be creating unacceptable metadata 
for many classes and for many languages. This is why we would like to foster stronger collaboration and more appreciation between classic library tasks and computational approaches. And these are the references for um, this talk. And we thank you, your attention in all the languages that we have analyzed. And we are happy, Enrique and I are happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, so we do have uh, some questions for the audience. Um, uh, one of the questions concerns the your results slide. Maybe you can go back to your results slide. And the question is, what is, what is the green line in the results graph? Yeah. So the green line is the um, random baseline. So this would be just if you know, following, you know, like um, flipping coins, like um, what would be the results if we would just um, take, uh, in these cases, the, uh, the um, majority um, class, uh, right, Enrique? So this is, this baseline is just to see um, how difficult yeah. it would be. Yeah, sorry, Enrique, go ahead. Yeah, the, so the baseline we used uh, is a random baseline, exactly. Um, I'm not completely sure if this is the random baseline, by the way. <laughs> I know, yeah, it is, it is. Yeah, it is. It is, yeah. It is. So basically, you take the same distribution that you had in your original training data or test data, and you just scramble all the, all the assignments. I see. Um, so another question. Uh, it's a, maybe this is one of my interests. Uh, but can, I, I noticed that you gave some examples uh, where the source text was in multiple languages. So is is the the source text always um, the language is always identified, or do you have? Um, natural language processing at those early stages of your pipeline uh, to process different, to treat each of the languages uh, appropriately? Yes. So, etc. Yeah. Um, so we do have the information about the language in the catalog, which uh, is manually annotated. And um, the coverage of this information in the catalog is very high. It's around 95% of the cases, uh, which in comparison to other fields is very high. And one of the things that we didn't want to do is to use different models for the different languages. So we used one single model uh, for the different languages. Um, so this is why we also use uh, the tokenizer for Embert uh, to be able to, to, uh, to obtain tokens also that they are comparable uh, between different languages. Very well, thank you. Because as I mentioned before, the catalog contains 400 languages. So if we would apply one model per language, we would need to maintain 400 models. And this is what we don't want to do. Very well, so you adopted the language independent approach. Exactly. Very well. Um, so let, let me move to another question. Um, do you recommend application of automatic classification to selected parts of collections? like just some languages and focus intellectual indexing on the difficult cases? That's a good question. Um, that's a good question. And I think um, this is the kind of questions that we actually wanted to, to, to foster with this presentations and uh, with this presentation, you know, to, to make uh, our community more aware that, um, you know, in some cases, we really shouldn't be using subset indexing automatic. Um, a person should be looking very closely to some cases and others are, uh, are very easy. And we are, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the um, the time that we should spend with, with the different classes is actually different. Um, so um, probably this is the kind of, yeah, probably, um, or 
we need to go, we need to, I mean, we have only analyzed two different categories. We have analyzed only language and classes, but probably there are all the categories which are influencing the res these results. So we should be looking more into what is not going well and which are the information, you know, which are the parts of the ca or catalog that we should be looking closer. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jose. Uh, you, you, yeah, you reported that, that more data you would have uh, the better the system would perform. Uh, did you find a level where it would, where, it, where you could identify that the curve would really be uh, much better? Um, well, the depends of the of the of the category, right? I mean, here, for example, as I mentioned before, we don't see here. Uh, uh, um, we don't see a real line here, and we see some tendencies, but we don't see here a real line. And um, of course, there is different. You know, these categories um, are, are, you know, they are applied together. Um, so probably um, one publication published in Galician and in their class um, with fewer records is going to be even harder than than the other ones. Um, so it is, yeah, we cannot really say um, at this point or these categories, um, but more uh, the message of um, um, our catalogs are very heterogeneous. So we need to, we need to take care of this heterogeneity uh, whenever we apply algorithms. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Jose. We we would have oh, have lots of questions more, but I'm afraid we are uh, we have already exhausted our time. So um, I ask you and and Enrique if you can please have a look at the chat and and try to give some feedback to the audience there. Uh, so I thank uh, all the the three speakers from today. Uh, thanks you also for for the audience. So, uh, SWEEP uh, will resume tomorrow uh, at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, with a session on linked open data applications. So, thanks again, everyone. See you tomorrow. Good evening. Bye. Bye.